hello everybody. Is it on? Sorry. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming here to discuss uh, a planet to win, why we need a Green New Deal. I think we have seen and are going to continue to see a lot of different blueprints and proposals and visions for what a Green New Deal should look like. I'm going to go ahead and say that this one is the best one. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and... Sorry? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I will be louder. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, to my right is Kate Aronoff. She is a fellow at the Type Media Center and a contributing writer to The Intercept. Her writing has appeared in The Guardian, The Intercept, The Nation, Harper's, Jacobin, Jacobin Dissident, and The These Times. Uh, among other outlets, she's appeared on Democracy Now!, on the media, and numerous other television shows, radio programs, and broadcasts. Uh, Thea Rio Francos is an assistant professor of political science at Providence College and the author of Resource Radicalisms, forthcoming from Duke University Press. Her writings appeared in The Guardian and Plus One, Jacobin, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Dissent, and In These Times, among other outlets. She's been interviewed on The Dig and Behind the News and numerous other podcasts and radio programs. <laughs> she also serves on the steering committee of DSA's Eco-Socialist Working Group. Uh, Daniel Cohen is an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Pennsylvania, where he directs the Social Spatial Climate Collaborative. Uh, his writing has appeared in The Guardian, Nature, The Nation, Jacobin, Public Books, The Verso Blog, and Dissent, among other outlets. He's been interviewed on The Dig and Behind the News, and numerous other podcasts and radio programs. And we have Alyssa Battistoni. She's a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University and editor at Jacobin and an associate faculty member of the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. Her writings appeared in The Guardian and Plus One, The Nation, Jacobin, and these times the same. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I think each one of them is going to say a little bit about the book. Uh, I'm not sure who's going to start. I think it's Alyssa who wants to start us off, I guess. Um, is this working? Yes. Um, okay, thank you everyone so much for coming out. It's really awesome to see uh, so many people here. We're really grateful to you for uh, spending your Saturday night here with us and we will have, uh, we'll try to make it fun. Um, but so what I'm gonna do, we're each gonna talk really briefly and try to keep this uh, to just a few minutes each so that we have some time to talk with Osita and then to have some questions and comments from you all. Um, but so what I'm gonna do is just outline the, the really core argument of, of the book of, and, and of what we're arguing for, and that's essentially that uh, a radical Green New Deal is an effective Green New Deal. Um, and this is, uh, we, we wrote this book in, in response to seeing both uh, what feels like a real change in, in climate politics and, and climate policy over the past year or so, um, and the sort of, uh, you know, sequence of the IPCC report from about a year ago saying, you know, 12 years uh, to save the climate. I know that's a simplification, um, but we all know this report. Um, uh, AOC being elected to Congress and immediately saying, I'm going to make the Green New Deal one of my major pl policy platforms. Um, Sunrise sitting in uh, at Nancy Pelosi's office, the Green New Deal resolution coming out in February. Um, we had the sequence of events and momentum building around climate action, which was really exciting, and yet the question was always, well, what is the Green New Deal? Uh, a lot of people signed on to the Green New Deal resolution who um, we, you know, think maybe didn't fully support all of <laughs> its measures. Uh, and yet, at the same time, the, the response from um, both the, well, the response from the right was, um, this is like, you know, Stalinism in action, and the response from the center was, uh, well, this is nice, but this is a socialist wish list tacked onto um, the real climate program, which is uh, sort of narrowly focused on energy. Uh, what we really need is like a carbon tax, some um, R&D money for some green tech, uh, maybe a few incentives here and there, but we, we don't need to, why are we adding all of these other things like a job guarantee and healthcare and all of these social programs that are distinct from um, what real, uh, the real core of climate action should be. And so what we're really trying to argue in this book is that, A, uh, you can't distinguish, um, you can't really separate out social programs from climate or environmental programs because climate change um, is a phenomenon that is, is emergent from our social and economic systems more broadly. We can't just say, well, climate is over here and you know how we live, where we live, where we work, uh, what kinds of, um, you know, what our, our, our modes of consumption and production are, are completely separate. So we have to actually think about those things together. And I think that that's what the Green New Deal resolution started to get at. Um, but then also uh, that if we want to build a real, um, that, that to take the kind of um, 
really serious, to make this kinds of really serious changes that we know are necessary, we have to have, they have to have political support, we have to have, uh, you know, a, a political movement that can both push for these, that can, that can institute them. We can't sneak these kinds of changes through the back door. And so instead of having a technocratic climate policy that's saying, you know, um, nobody pay attention to this thing happening over here, we're just gonna do some like executive actions that nobody is, uh, uh, is, is really knows about or nobody, um, we don't have to build um, popular support for. We really need to think about how um, a climate program can, can build that support. And that's by, we argue, um, doing things that make uh, life better for people in the present rather than saying, um, you will have to sacrifice now for uh, the benefit of future generations, for the benefit of uh, the, the climate and the abstract. Um, um, that actually there are a lot of ways that uh, that climate action, that action to decarbonize the economy can actually um, also address social inequalities, can make people's lives better, can uh, promise public abundance, public goods, um, and the things that we, uh, that we need instead of just saying more uh, austerity but green this time. Um, and so we, we really think that that's not just um, a lot of... Basically that the politics is really essential to anything like this happening and so we're trying to make the case for what um, that politics could look like. Um, and then we do that sort of in a few, uh, like uh, the bulk of the book is going through different sort of issue areas, I guess, but we're trying not to think of them as just like an issue or a silo kind of type of thing. Like there's like transportation or agriculture or housing as completely separate things, but rather um, broader ways of thinking about how politics and economics and carbon all fit together um, around sort of broader areas of life. And so um, uh, Daniel and Thea will say a bit more about what some of those are, and then I think Kate will wrap us up with some uh, concluding thoughts. So thanks. Okay, is this loud enough? Yeah, okay, too loud maybe. Um, so um, thank you for that wonderful introduction to our book, Alyssa. And so I'm kind of diving into some of the substantive chapters here and Daniel will pick up where I left off. And so how our book opens is thinking about the political train of the Green New Deal. And there's a few ways to think about that, but one is who are our enemies, right? What, who, what are our obstacles and who are our enemies? And that's something we wanted to confront head on. Um, and so we open the book by arguing that the first task of a radical Green New Deal is dismantling fossil capitalism. And you do that in a variety of ways. Um, First and foremost, we kind of take up the climate justice call that we need to keep it in the ground. We need to keep the oil and the coal and the gas in the ground. Um, and we need to do this because the climate science clearly says that we need to do this. But as Alyssa just said, this is not just about the climate science or climate experts. It's also about what makes things politically possible. And our belief is that we make things politically possible by having clear kind of positive visions, but also by targeting clear enemies that everyone loves to hate, like fossil fuel executives, right? So there's a kind of left populist vision here around targeting who the worst polluters are, using the repressive arm of the state and the prosecutorial arm of the state and the regulatory arm of the state to keep that in the ground, to tax them out of existence and to regulate them out of existence. Um, so that's, that's kind of our, our vision of, of who the enemy is um, and how to tackle them. Um, but we also have not just a kind of a negative or, or antagonistic vision, also a very positive one about public ownership of the energy system. Um, and as Bernie Sanders said it recently, get the greed out of our energy system, right? So it's not just about um, a kind of private market version of renewables, but how can we actually think about energy as a commons, um, as something that we govern together democratically? Um, and just real briefly, as a shout out to some awesome activists in the corner over there, afterwards, if you're interested in getting involved with a public power campaign in New York City, um, DSA is back there to take your name and number. Um, but um, so kind of moving through a bit more of the book, um, as we build this wonderful new world of democratic, egalitarian, uh, uh, renewable energy and, and, and kind of low carbon societies, what we don't want to do is replicate kind of the patterns of exploitation and extraction that mark fossil capitalism, right? And this could actually happen quite easily in the sense that renewable energy technologies require a lot of stuff that comes out of the earth, right? They require lithium and cobalt and nickel. They require energy intensive production like steel. So if you want to build a wind turbine or a solar panel, 
um, or lithium batteries or have energy storage, you need stuff that comes from the earth. And a lot of that stuff is in the global south and is in, in parts of the world where um, sort of the existing 500 years of fossil capitalism have already kind of ravaged and devastated. So we wanted to think about how a Green New Deal could, must and could be an internationalist Green New Deal. Like have global justice as its horizon rather than just sort of a national or domestic vision of an energy transition. And so we do that in a couple of different ways. Um, one is something that Daniel will talk more about in a moment, which is actually thinking about how to build a low carbon world that is less resource intensive. That actually takes planetary limits and the, you know, the existing limits of our earth kind of seriously and thinks about how can we work within those and build egalitarian public pleasure and affluence um, for all um, without being so rapacious in terms of resource extraction. So some of that is about kind of privileging collective consumption over privatized and individualized consumption. So not a world of a billion Teslas, but a world of electric buses and also a world where we do things um, with our time that aren't so um, carbon intensive. And um, then the last piece of that is also thinking about um, kind of a twofold left vision for a global Green New Deal. On the one hand, kind of re new relationships of solidarity across the supply chains that, that build a, um, a low carbon renewable world, but also having a real left vision for what trade should look like, which I think is something that, or we think is something that the, the left has shied away from a little bit because trade is kind of co opted by neoliberals and then the anti-trade stuff is kind of co-opted by the revanchist right. And so instead of that, we offer a vision for what just trade would look like and start with the supply chains of renewable energy to kind of map out um, how trade can um, be organized along democratic um, and low carbon principles. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Thea. Um, <laughs> thank you all for coming out on this uh, beautiful cold night in the midst of a planetary emergency <laughs> that is going nowhere until we stop it. Um, so we have to keep our eyes on the prize, and that is, in our case, for this book, Class Struggle and Reducing the Resource Intensity of Public Luxury. We also have to create the public luxury, um, in this country especially. We have to create the public luxury, we have to reduce its resource intensity. So we need to use systems thinking, or what the original Uncle Carl called dialectics. Um, <laughs> And so in the kind of material, like, you know, straightforwardly materialist piece here, the idea is how can we think about the energy system in a, in a much broader way than simply solar panels and wind turbines, which we talk about and love. Um, but we have to understand the goal of the energy system as being an efficiency that's not the technocrat's efficiency, but it's an efficiency that says every solar panel we don't build, every rechargeable battery we don't build is less mining, less exploitation, less political strife elsewhere. So it is an internationalist obligation to have the most efficient possible system. And I won't go into the wonky details about why we think we need a big public grid that, yes, has local microgrids in it, but no room for things like solar separatism, which are just private schools or private health care by another name, where you defect from the grid and simply build out all the batteries and solar panels you need just for the rich. Um, that's not the solution. Instead, we need to think about the energy system mixed in with the housing system, that only with the Green New Deal for housing, green retrofits to public housing, and you might have heard a little bit about that this week. Um, green retrofits to public housing, I, <laughs> maybe in the Q&A, maybe in the Q&A. <laughs> if I start talking about green social housing, you'll all be, you know, you'll be breaking out the cots. Um, the Green New Deal for housing, new social housing that is no carbon. We need to reimagine public transportation, not just to fetishize density, much as we love the transportation nerds, but to instead think about a density of freedoms that comes from a wide range of mobility options governed as much as possible by the public so that people don't want or need cars, but the unionized drivers of public transportation, of minivans, of electric buses, of trains, move us around, and we need to pick up one of the better ideas of the New Deal, which is this idea that public recreation is a massive infrastructural investment. In the New Deal, it was the third or fourth biggest line item, and we call for public recreation as constructing the landscape in which we will live the low carbon, beautiful life. Um, we also note that, of course, the New Deal in many ways hardened Jim Crow, and so we need a political vision that is not about throwing various radicalisms, certainly not throwing black radicalisms under the bus, but building on those radicalisms. And that political piece takes us to the labor question. Um, we have to build a labor movement that is big enough and broad enough to push these ideas through. 
And we endorse absolutely the concept of a just transition, but we're worried that the conversation about labor and climate change is so often focused on men in hard hats and simply taking men in hard hats away from the oil rig and into the wind turbine factory, which is great. But there are tens of thousands uh, or hundreds of thousands more care workers who do low carbon work already. <laughs> and they are mo going on strike very militantly. Many of them, LA teachers, nurses are endorsing Bernie, which is great. Um, but there is a massive, massive workforce right now and where the labor milit militancy is, is in the social reproduction sector. And as we say, we have to build a new world. We have to build a world of public luxury that takes resource intensity away, that reduces the work week, but then we have to live in that world. And it's that horizon that we can start building towards right now when we see the green jobs fight and the just transition for labor fight as being fundamentally rooted in care work, very, very often done by women of color uh, in this country. Um, and we kind of, we argue in the book that we need to strike for sunshine. We recall the example of Pauline Newman, who was a garment worker uh, about 100 years ago, 107 years ago, who talked about how glorious it would be to have our time in the sunshine, to have a short working day and the delights that would come from this leisure space. So we will have that time in the sunshine, but we do have to fight for it. And Kate's gonna tell you a little bit more about that. The, okay, yeah, it's working. Um, yeah, so I mean, throughout the book, as you may have gotten a sense from the kind of summaries thus far, um, we're really trying to th kind of thread between three different things. So I think one that we were thinking about is a really kind of doom and gloom, apocalyptic vision of climate change that you get um, basically whenever some new study comes out. Um, you'll have like stock images of these like bombed out landscapes um, sort of showing what the world will look like. You get these apocalyptic headlines, all of that. Um, so we know that you know the world will be uh, worse. We know well. We know that the world will be uh, hit by more climate impacts, right? Um, but we, you know, are contesting over that future, and also um, contesting sort of against the very techno optimist vision um, of what the green transition looks like. Sort of coming from you know the likes of people like Michael Bloomberg. Um, Maybe it'll land on his presidential platform, who knows? But um, sort of telling us that you know, we can just switch out uh, our energy source and that will get us where we need to be. Everything is, is basically fine. We just need to like, uh, make a few tweaks along the way. And we have the technology. We have everything we need to do this. And, and the world is, is great as is. Um, so you know, don't, don't worry too much about this. The engineers and the scientists will figure it out. Um, and then you know, a third one, which is more uh, endemic to the, to the Green New Deal itself, which is this sort of vision of, of an economic mobilization um, as the sort of you know, forward horizon. And while we certainly draw on a lot of metaphors, both from um, the war mobilization, sort of an interesting, very interesting period of American history, and the New Deal itself, um, we don't sort of take that as, as our vision for what the, the future should look like. Um, and so, you know, toward that end, we, we know, of course, that the 21st century will be a radical century, whether, uh, whether we like it or not. Uh, we know that the level of climate impacts locked in, uh, we're on, on track for about one degree Celsius of warming as is, um, likely a bit more than that. Um, and you can read no shortage of reports telling us kind of what that, what that means just for the physical, uh, physical environment. Um, but you know, we are positive about what this future could look like, and I'll say a little bit more about that, but we're also not naive about what it, what it also could look like, um, which is more of what we're already seeing in storms like Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Katrina, the wildfires in California, um, where you have uh, elements in society, whether that's neo-fascist, whether that's, um, you know, the, the far right, the Donald Trumps of the world, um, really using this crisis as their opportunity um, for profit, for criminalization, for hardening borders. Um, that is scarily kind of the path that we're on, right? Is, is to allow um, you know, the climate crisis to be uh, an excuse to, for more, uh, more of what we're already seeing. Um, and letting the kind of McKinsey's of the world uh, you know, pick the bones off of, off of the climate wreckage. Um, so we think, an alternative to that is, is brutally necessary um, to be able to say what we actually want um, this future to look like that is not just uh, indefinitely kind of mobilizing, you know, building, uh, filling the world with solar panels year after year after year after year. There's a little bit of that, but hopefully that stops at some point. Hopefully we, um, you know, live in this world that um, is, is, is closer to what um, Daniel and Thea have just, have just laid out um, of 
kind of abundant um, public luxury and, and gets to kind of what we see as the intervention of the Green New Deal, which is not just a suite of climate policies, it's not just um, a suite of policies to improve life as we know it, um, but is really a sort of new social contract, a new sort of way of thinking about how we relate to each other, how we relate to um, nature, how we relate to sort of every um, facet of the world. Um, in the way that, you know, the New Deal at its most ambitious moments really, um, really sort of came to be and got close to in, in, in some cases and really rethinking um, what we owe to one another. Um, and, and we think that's an especially important question in the 21st century where things will get uh, much more intense, uh, whether, you know, in, in any scenario. And so we, we argue to use that intensity to use these crises that are coming toward us, whether that's, you know, climate crises, climate impacts, or a recession that we're facing to really take advantage, full advantage as the right has done for years and years and years um, of every crisis that comes our way to build, um, to build the world we really want. And so, you know, looking back to um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Economic Bill of Rights, um, we sort of lay out the five, uh, what we call the five freedoms um, that should define kind of this new world um, as the principles of, of, of what, we're, what we're really building. And so I won't, you know, you can read them in the book and I would encourage you to. Um, <laughs> Some of them are fairly self-explanatory, but a freedom from fear, so protection from the elements and from criminalization, from, you know, being targeted in various ways, freedom from toil, um, so against sort of meaningless work um, and toward, you know, meaningful work and, and less work overall, um, the freedom to move, so encapsulating both the need to um, build out our luxurious uh, high-speed rail uh, going, you know, cr crisscrossing cities, but also for migration and taking, being honest about the fact that uh, the next century will make many parts of the world unlivable, um, and we need to respond to that in a way that's humane, in a way that's thoroughly internationalist um, and really welcomes people um, with, you know, open arms and public housing. Um, freedom from domination um, against the sort of authoritarianism that could well define um, our warming world. Um, in fr and freedom from domination in places like, you know, our, our jobs, uh, where we have a, a you know, a, a economic system which, which creates sort of mini authoritarians in, in all of our bosses. Um, and finally, freedom to live. Um, so, you know, reframing climate politics not as a politics of death and of sacrifice, um, but as a politics of life and luxury. Uh, and that's where we, we sort of end, and that's, and that's what the, the fight is about. So one of the ideas that you take on or criticize early on in this book is the rhetoric of individual responsibility and environmentalism. It is all, of course, true that uh, we all use fossil fuel energy, um, but then more moderate voices in the environmental movement will then use this as a jumping off point to say, well, the key to climate action is we all have to buy green, we all have to put the solar panels on our own roofs, we have to buy our own electric cars. Can you talk about uh, why it's important to dislodge that way of thinking and, and how we might go about encouraging people to think differently? So whoever wants to start, yeah. Take on the side, boys. <laughs> sure. Uh, da Daniel, if you caught that. Um, uh, th yeah, I'm, I'm not going to explain what climate sad boys are. Maybe we can get to that in the <laughs> Q&A. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the politics of individual responsibility and climate um, is such a... I mean, this, Naomi Klein calls this a case of historical bad timing, which is that uh, you have awareness of the climate crisis, awareness of, of greenhouse gases and all these things really enter the public consciousness at the zenith of neoliberalism. So at this time, not only where um, politicians on both side of, sides of the Atlantic, namely Ronald Reagan and um, Margaret Thatcher, are um, trying to sort of break down the idea of society, right? You have Margaret Thatcher sort of famously saying there's no such thing as a society, there are only men and women um, who are each in themselves responsible for their, for their own faults and problems. Um, and we've seen, you know, the way that that translates itself into, into climate, into, you know, all number of environmental issues and, and, and issues, um, you know, that, that uh, are less sort of tied to, um, tied to the natural world. Um, and that, you know, you everyone is blamed for, the, for their own suffering. Um, and that has been sort of a defining push of, of climate politics, um, which is to say exactly, you know, as you articulated that um, uh, this is our fault, we all are part of the problem, you know, some of us are more responsible, but, you know, uh, everyone is ultimately to blame um, for what this is. But I think what's, you know, what that 
the story of kind of what's happened in the last 30 years, um, what can get left out sometimes in talking about it is that it was also an attempt to um, dismantle the idea of class interests and dismantle the idea um, that there are certain parts of society which have a structural um, capacity and a structural incentive to consume in remarkable, remarkable ways and to encourage other people to consume. And so if you are thinking about our warming world or thinking about rising greenhouse gases, um, and you say, oh, well, you know, we're all sort of part of this. That really um, isn't helpful for thinking about people like fossil fuel executives um, who are um, in a, a position, whether, whether or not, you know, we think Rex Tillerson is personally kind of loathsome, which I do, um, <laughs> but um, the, the position of a fossil fuel executive is one that encourages the worst and most sort of um, rapacious types of consumption. Um, and so I think what um, what we're trying to do sort of in the book, as Thea mentioned, is to reassert the fact that there are very different, um, uh, there are you know many, many different people in society um, and the billionaires, the fossil fuel executives, um, people who are not, I think, you know, if they're billionaires in the audience, it, it, Godspeed. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but are not, you know, most people on, on Earth, um, and that we are not all collectively responsible for this problem. It is the fault of very specific elements um, and people who have actively fed this crisis, fed misinformation about it to the public, have spent millions and millions and millions of dollars um, supporting a business model which we know is incompatible with the future of human civilization. Um, and so I think, you know, when I see people like, um, you know, Jonathan Safran Foer making these broad arguments about human nature or Jonathan Franzen, sub out whatever Jonathan you would like, um, <laughs> Uh, that is is kind of what we're what we're um, coming up against here. Um, so, in addition to everything Kate just said, I think you know one of the things we're also trying to point to and argue is that obviously we need the the framework of sort of individual responsibility that Kate just described in the sense that you know we we all rely on fossil fuels and so we're all responsible. And we should just count our carbon footprints and sort of obsess over that and obsess over how we can make different and better consumer choices um, is really uh, even within that framework. If you don't even have alternatives, uh, you like what choice are you going to make? If you can't take uh, you know if there is no public transportation, you're going to drive your car. Um, if you you don't often have a choice over what how your electricity is produced, um, it's not even even there's not even a, an option. Um, and essentially, that all of our consumer choices are collective uh, choices and choices about how we have built our infrastructure, about how we, you know, the world we live in and, and what that is and how that is, uh, how that's organized. And so we really can't think about it as an individual type of thing. Um, and that the only way to, to think about those kinds of politics is as a, a collective project of, of what kind of world we want to make. And so, um, and that's part of the, the argument for things like public goods and services that, you know, where you can have forms of public consumption. Um, it's not like all consumption is bad and we should just feel bad about consuming and that that's like some mark of original sin or something like that, as you <laughs> will read in some accounts. Uh, but that, you know, it's like, it's cons consuming can be good, but we should do it in less resource intensive ways that are not going to, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, and result in the kinds of terrible things that we know will come with climate change. So, um, yeah. Cool. Um, it seems to me that there are like two levels of action that we're talking about here. On, on the one hand, there's this sort of like big national industrial remaking of our energy system. Daniel, you mentioned a little bit the public grid or like establishing a continental grid, which is this huge project. And then, uh, Another level that's just, you know, local communities deciding what their needs are, having these sort of like small democratically run projects on, on that level. How do you make sure that those two levels of the project are integrated where you're having democratic processes represented at every stage of the project and every level of the project? And it's not just sort of a, a, a wholly national uh, thing where you're actually representing the communities involved. Thank you, thank you, that's a great question. And I think you pick up, so we talk in the book often about these, like we need these really huge things. We need a continental grid, polycentric, but we also keep saying that local communities have to have control over what's happening. So what does that actually look like in practice? I think talking about a continental grid might be a bit wonky for this crowd, <laughs> but um, certainly it is the case. I mean, we know, we see from the, the New Deal and World War II are just the, at the moments in the United States history when you have massive public intervention of the economy and extremely effective. And we know the problems that those eras have. We absolutely know them. 
We also know that we've had a lot of problems for 40 years that the market has only made worse. Um, and so we try to work a little bit with the examples that we have. The, um, the vision of how we combine these things, I think it's helpful to get follow the carbon into the kind of materiality of it. So one question is, how do we beautifully design landscapes of wind and solar energy? And we can take examples from Northern Europe where you have a combination of community ownership and beautiful design and consultation. That's super interesting. But then there's also the, the sort of idea that when you pour federal funds into something like public housing, new green public housing or retrofitting public housing, that program design, as in the bill that AOC and Bernie have just put forward, is about very stringent requirements that the um, retrofit has to create zero carbon housing, that it has to create resiliency centers in the public homes that benefit the entire community in times of extreme weather, that the jobs have to go to resident-owned businesses and cooperatives, and we describe that at some length. Um, we talk about that in the book and, and, in the, and is in the bill. Um, and so the, idea, the vision is that you need the, the power of the federal purse to just unlock these resources, but the goal is to transfer money to communities where we have a diversity of governance structures. If you want to make your public housing stock into a community land uh, trust that has 0% possibility of being on the market, great. I, mean, I think that's the kind of vision that we really like. Um, and the same would go for public transportation. We talk about in rural places like in Appalachia, you'd want to have worker cooperatives running fleets of electric minivans. It doesn't have to all be run by the federal government. So it's really an attempt to unlock federal resources. No other level of government has that kind of power. And then to cede local democratic self-control. Um, and I think we've seen in the US and in other countries around the world that that can work really well. Um, very optimistic. And I think that idea of almost sort of transcending this, like, like you were saying, Alyssa, the vision of the right is like, oh, this is like Stalinism on steroids. It's, it's, it's really not. What it's more like is like NYCHA, you know, oh, what am I going to put them on? <laughs> It's like Nitro and Kale, you know. <laughs> um, and by the way, they do, the bill does include um, organic grocers uh, in, all, in public housing complexes. So yeah, I think that the, the vision can be, can be truly beautiful. I mean, um, yeah, the last thing, I mean, we know, from, we know from the worst examples of the New Deal what can happen, but we also know that there are programs like Works Progress Administration. There are many, many programs like the Rural Electrification, where you do empower local collectivities. And I think our vision is to try to push as far as we possibly can that combination of the big um, and the, and the self-control. Um, I'll just add one brief thing onto that, which is that we extend this kind of dialectic of plan and democracy or local and sort of large scale across the entire um, across the entire globe in terms of our global vision and our internationalist vision. So something that we try to hold in our minds simultaneously is the idea that communities should have self-determination, consent, consultation if resources are being extracted from where they live, right? They should have the right of democratic sovereignty, you know, if it's a community that lives near lithium or cobalt or whatever it is, right? Um, so we don't have any kind of top-down vision in which those resources should just be taken no matter what. And so there are international indigenous and environmental rights that need to be respected. Um, um, at the same time, though, we don't see the possibility for how those could be respected without a sort of architecture of left trade that actually requires and forces and has some repressive capacity to punish in the case of not respecting those, right? So we don't see, you know, again, kind of like state and democracy plan and democracy as mutually exclusive or as these scales of governance as mutually exclusive, but you need to kind of find ways to embed local democratic governance within structures that actually give them resources and teeth. Um, globe and, and stretch that over the globe as a whole. I was wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about the role of leisure and leisure time in this vision. Uh, I think that when people think about climate politics, as was mentioned, it can often feel very grim, the world is ending and so on, but what you create in this book is this really beautiful vision of uh, workers having time off to themselves, they can explore nature, they can take hikes, they can do all kinds of things in this new uh, energy economy. And I was wondering if you could sort of give each of you your take on, on what, why that part of the, the vision is important to you. I mean, okay. I, so, okay. Sure. Um, so I would say, <laughs> sorry. Democracy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, in the, in, in our argument about um, about you know what sort of labor looks like under a, a green new deal it's you know various 
we have arguments about different kinds of work we should be doing, about the kinds of work we need to do to be building this world as Daniel described and to live in it, um, but also uh, arguing for less work and more time to enjoy our lives. And so I think there are a few different inspirations to that. One is the history of the labor movement, which has often fought for less work, um, obviously for uh, for the weekend, for the 40-hour work week, which was, you know, under the New Deal, was the, the demand was for 30 hours and 40 was the compromise. And so, um, you know, we should uh, revive that, that demand for less work, certainly. Um, and we think this is because, I mean, for, for I think twofold reasons is one that, um, you know, we know we can meet people's needs with less work than we currently do. We know that uh, many studies show that shorter work weeks are, uh, you know, lower carbon emissions. Um, and we should, but we should also have, uh, as part of the vision of a good life that is based around things like, um, you know, time to spend uh, with other people, to spend, uh, you know, in spaces of, of public luxury and, and doing things that are not working, um, which many people don't have the opportunity to do these days. And so I think they're, you know, we take inspiration from, um, from workers who are organizing around things like one job should be enough, the idea that you shouldn't have to work multiple low-wage jobs in order to afford a place to live to, um, at where, or a place for you and your kids to live, but that you never see your kids because you're working multiple jobs, um, that there is actually that desire in the labor movement right now. Um, but we also take, as Daniel mentioned, I'm just going to read a little bit from this like uh, amazing uh, op-ed we found, or like editorial from this woman, Pauline Newman, where she writes um, about what workers can stand to gain from working less, and this is 1912 and in the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union. Um, and she says, what a glorious time is spring. Despair vanishes, gloom is forgotten. How would you like to run about the week recently awakened country rather than sit at the machine? Oh, how you would like to drink in the pure air and be warm by the sunshine. How you would like to roam about in the fields, dreaming and admiring the beauty of nature. And I feel like this vision of like, actually you can leave the factory, the mill, the department store while the sun is shining that she's articulating 100 years ago is very much should be the vision of, that we have today, which is like you don't have to sit uh, at the factory, at the, you know, at the counter. Um, you can go and enjoy your life in the sun. Um, and from that, I think we also take, a, uh, you know, or I certainly take inspiration for Virginia Woolf's call to be alive in the sunshine with 500 pounds a year. And so uh, <laughs> we, we, we think that living, being alive in the sunshine is a pretty good way to live your life. So, um, and then there's like visions uh, that other, that how that, I think that vision has played out throughout the different aspects of our, um, there are other ways that that plays out. And so other people can say more about that. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think this comes a bit to your first question. So what is the value of public goods rather than individual consumer choice. If you create public goods, people don't ever want to let them go. And we've seen this. People stay in parks. People defend now public housing, which is literally crumbling, which has double the rate of cockroach infestation, double the rate of broken toilets. People defend these public goods. And as Alyssa was saying, when you look historically at the big wins of the labor movement, we can talk about France, massive expansion of leisure where workers would garden, they would go to the beach, they would pile bicycles on rail cars to get out of the city. And speaking of garment workers, we have in the Lower East Side a building that was built in homage to the Karl Marx Hof housing complex in Vienna. It's called the Amalgamated Dwelling. And it was built for socialist garment workers in New York City with rooftop balconies so that workers could dance and play the violin into the night and with a stage um, in the ground floor in a community theater. And we, you know, we looked at a bit some of the archives and architect showed us around. And I think it's important to, as others are saying, to get out of the kind of extreme instrumentality of neo neoliberalism, where it's just sort of taken for granted that we're not allowed to fight for anything good, and to instead think, what is the literal physical work we have to do to make this good life possible, where we can spend time with our loved ones? And we talk about creating um, massive investments in public infrastructure of essentially public recreation. In the New Deal, this was because in the New Deal, there was a 40-hour work week and the end of prohibition. And sociologists worried that in this leisure gap, workers would only be able to <laughs> turn to prostitution and gambling. <laughs> and so somebody like Robert Moses, who in many ways is horrible, but had a staff of literally 1,800 people creating leisure spaces in New York City and a vast proportion of the parks, playgrounds, rivers, two public beachfronts in New York City built under Moses, uh, by Moses in New York City. So I think we want to say not even just like, why should we have leisure? There are good reasons to have it, but also what is the physical project of creating that world of leisure? And it turns out that's a project of creating non-resource intensive spaces for enjoyment that nobody will ever let go. 
And I think that's, again, part of, the power, part of the way you get beyond individualism is through public investment in shared goods that people will defend. And that's, it's like ratcheting up, ratcheting up, ratcheting up. When people get used to living that way, they're gonna want more, and they're gonna want more, and they're gonna want more. We have to deliver the goods. Like by 2023, this is not a book about 2050, it's a book about the 2020s, delivering the goods right away. Leisure, sunshine, renewable energy, want more of it, strike again. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think Daniel and Alyssa both both laid that out um, really well. I mean, I think in in all of the sort of arguments about human nature that get made in relation to climate change, they're all just these creatures who want to you know buy more things at Target. Um, I think that you know ignores a, a, a big part of human nature, which is the sort of like a real desire for leisure and to do, you know, to do nothing and just hang out with each other. Um, you know, the reason, part of the reason we have um, fossil fuels in the first place um, is because um, in sort of early industrial England, um, all of the, the the water power that was used in sort of early mills and things um, was located along the Thames, along sort of water in in the UK. Um, and the people who ran these factories had a problem, which is that um, people just would not show up to work um, because there were like five-day festivals all the time. Um, and people would just drink and party. Um, and uh, the, the way that early industrialists dealt with that was to move production to the cities um, where they had a captive labor force which needed to f you know, really struggle for existence um, and they could have this centralized coal power um, that they could power their factories with there instead of relying on water along the rivers where everybody just wanted to sort of, you know, lay around uh, and, 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 you know, hang out with their friends. Um, so it's, it's utterly just false that, that the only sort of way that we know how to enjoy our freedom and enjoy our, um, enjoy our lives is through consuming, consuming more. Um, and we can consume, you know, better as, as sort of we've, we've talked about here. Um, I also just wanted to say, you know, I think we underestimate just how big, you know, a, a level of industrial policy, a level of economic mobilization that we're um, going to be experiencing is, I was reading um, from, the, from the first New Deal, um, kind of a, a collection of essays from this guy Rexford Tugwell, um, who led up a lot of the sort of um, agricultural programs. He had a number of jobs throughout that, um, but, and is you know, far from a perfect human, but he is giving um, this talk to a sort of women's society in I think 1933. The name of the talk is Wine, Women, and the New Deal. Um, and much of it is encouraging. Uh, the sort of context of that is that these women's societies, much of them and, and many of the people who were there um, had spent a long time fighting for prohibition as sort of a, 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 a staging ground for um, a lot of kind of feminist demands um, because of the way, you know, capitalism is structured largely. Um, so a lot of the talk is convincing um, women to support American wine production, and he spends a lot of time talking about how California wines are just as good as French wines, and um, they're no better, and they were, you know, we're subsidizing um, wine production in California as a New Deal program, as sort of an engine um, of economic development. And by way of doing this, I think he articulates sort of our um, vision for what that looks like. Um, so he's talking about the New Deal, and I'll just end with this. So it's, its objective, as stated by President Roosevelt himself, is to make possible a more abundant life for the American people. A more abundant life implies a happier and perhaps a less hectic type of existence for the average man and woman. It implies the enjoyment of the good things of life and security and content, contentment and the cultivation through such enjoyment of the good things of the spirit, reflection, philosophy, conversation, and leisure. So I think that's, we'd, we'd fall pretty close to that. <laughs> Uh, given all that we've seen in California these past couple of months uh, with PGE's role in the wildfires, you should probably talk a little bit about utilities. Uh, there's a section of the book where you talk about all of the existing precedents in this country for uh, collective management, collective ownership of public utilities. Can you talk about uh, what the, some of those models are and, and how we might go about spreading them? Um, yeah, so I, <laughs> I've been really involved in, in doing a lot of um, um, this work in DSA, and that's kind of actually how I learned about it initially, and then I think reading Kate's work, actually, like years ago, kind of helped me understand the degree to which 
the existing model of investor-owned utilities, which not all utilities are, but many are, and the rest that aren't are sort of governed by a similar um, uh, a set of regulations that has been so deeply shaped by neoliberalism and deregulation of the energy market that they basically function in similar ways. Um, but investor-owned utilities right now, like PG&E, like Con Ed, like National Grid, um, their business model is such that um, the only way that they can make money is by building out more fossil fuel infrastructure, pipelines, and LNG plants um, t in order and, and passing that on to ratepayers, right? So there's kind of a twofold problem here. On the one hand, um, their model or the sort of the business model incentivizes them to overbuild fossil fuel infrastructure beyond what we even need, so peaker plants, LNG plants, that are gonna live with us forever, like live with us well into the future beyond a kind of renewable transition. And on the other hand, they do this on the backs of ratepayers. So we all pay these monthly bills to these corporations whose primary responsibility is to their shareholders and to ensuring a healthy profit motive, a healthy profit line, excuse me. And so, we, we see like the, the sort of result of this is on the one hand, um, forest wildfires and sort of this totally mismanaged, mismanaged fossil fuel infrastructure. On the other hand, we have massive shutoffs and fuel, and fuel poverty and people unable to pay their bills. So it's just like the absolute, if you had to come up with the worst public, the worst utility system, this is the one that you would come up with, one that incentivizes fossil fuel dependence and that also passes that cost on to the most vulnerable. And there are you know, many people in New York State, in Rhode Island where I am, that actually can't afford their energy bills and their energy bills are going to line the pockets of shareholders that live around the world, right? So that's the problem. And then the question is, how do we build a different type of public utility that is both kind of shepherds us quickly to a renewable transition, but and does so in a way that is publicly managed and democratically controlled. Um, so I'll pass that on to whoever wants to take the rest of that. Okay. Do you want to say something too? <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I mean, I, so we, we talk a bit about PG&E in the book, um, some of which is, is now, you know, it's a situation that is evolving by the hour, basically. PG&E is uh, sitting in bankruptcy because of a um, law in California called inverse condemnation, um, which puts the sort of liability for fires onto utilities whose equipment is found to have sparked them. Um, and so uh, you now have um, hedge funds now sort of fighting over, over PG&E, people like Paul Singer um, and uh, Seth Bauman, who, or Seth um, Clareman, who are some of the biggest owners of Puerto Rican debt who also, you know, have engineered, engineered effectively um, crises in Argentina. Um, those are the people who are fighting over control of the energy system. And so what we say is that, uh, and, and, you know, that I think each of us have continued to write about and sort of do organizing our own sense is that, um, uh, that we can actually do something better than letting, you know, either Paul Singer or these utility executives kind of run our energy system. And in doing that, I mean, I think we are pretty clear that we are looking to avoid the sort of, you know, solar secessionism, as Daniel mentioned, um, of just having the sort of wealthiest, um, you know, wealthiest places have public ownership, right? So now you have San Francisco, which is um, bidding to buy up PG&E assets in its, in its service, tory, service territory, San Jose, another relatively wealthy city in California is... is um, uh, bidding to do the same. Um, and so you could imagine a sort of splintering of the energy system, right, where you have um, very green, very progressive, very um, well-run public utilities in very wealthy parts of, um, of a state or of the country, um, and then the rest of the grid is, is the sort of um, power provider of last resort. Um, and, and it is really sort of a race to the bottom to, um, you know, provide the worst service, the most polluting service, probably if we're going the way we are going with um, with, with investor-owned utilities now. Um, and so public ownership sort of prevents, presents an alternative to that, which is very real, which is that you know we have um, a grid right now which is rife with public ownership, Nebraska. Um, the state is entirely, um, uh, entirely public. Um, they have three public power districts which are run um, democratically. They have elections every so often are, I think, get around some of the sort of straw man arguments arguments made about a lot of the rural electric cooperatives, which, um, you know, is, is a matter for a different time, but um, have, you know, fallen prey to sort of old boys networks and things like that. Um, but we have really actually existing examples of public ownership, and it's in, not only in the U.S., but around the world where public ownership, you know, in places like the U.K. is overwhelmingly popular um, because people have a lived memory of this. 
Um, but I think what, uh, I mean, the last thing I'll say is just that I think investor-owned utilities, um, by virtue of having done about 100 years of, of lobbying and organizing in this direction, um, really get off the hook for how dramatically they shaped both our energy system and sort of politics um, more generally. So a lot of the tactics that we now know as things like climate denial, these disinformation campaigns um, to sort of um, really uh, go after, um, you know, go after sort of objective reality um, were first workshopped by um, investor-owned utilities in the 1920s to fight off public ownership. Um, and so uh, they, you know, took that and then transferred it um, in the 1990s um, to things like the Global Climate Coalition, um, where... Uh, Organizations like the Edison Electric Institute, which is a trade um, organization for investor-owned utilities, um, were foundational to how we now understand climate, spreading doubt, um, spending millions of dollars um, on PR campaigns to uh, undermine the Kyoto Protocol, undermine um, institutions like the IPCC and the scientific consensus on climate change. Um, and so I think they're it's exciting to see a sort of public conversation about uh, the role of companies like Exxon and Chevron and the fossil fuel industry in this, but investor-owned utilities are no less responsible for that. And, and part of what public ownership can do is just take away the money they used to do that, which often is ratepayer money. That is people who are now living through forest fires, who are now living through climate impacts sown by this crisis and by this flawed model of ownership, um, who are being made to pay for this stuff. Um, and not only that, but also, you know, aggressively fighting any sort of progress toward renewable energy at every level of government at the state level. You have, you know, EEI and its sort of um, minions at the state level will, will um, pour millions of dollars into public utility commission campaigns, into um, campaigns against anyone who's going to sort of make them do something they don't want to do. And I think thinking about these uh, utilities as political actors um, is, is so key to this, just because we can, there is an easy way to sort of neutralize all of that money that they spend polluting our political system. Um, and public ownership is core to that, you know, even, uh, and there, you know, are many more benefits of public ownership in itself. But I think that's, that's a big one. Uh, I think each of you should talk about uh, a little bit more about talk, making this into a, an actually international project. I mean, I think that when people talk about the Green New Deal, they're talking about it within the context of American domestic politics. Obviously, climate adaptation, climate action has to be a global uh, effort. Um, and you can talk a little bit, I think, Tia, about uh, your work looking into lithium extraction in particular. I think that's really interesting. But I think as a broader question, how do, you, how do we make this into an international project where we're wrapping in other countries, uh, but in a way that it's not a solely West-directed uh, initiative where it's truly collaborative. We're not just pushing other countries around to meet targets, but everybody sort of has a hand in determining what ought to be done. All right, well, one, one kind of idea that we come up with in the book is a global Green New Deal kind of club. Um, so the idea of having um, a, a multilateral body um, through which countries, governments that are um, governments that are interested in, in having Green New Deal type policies, probably through social movement pressure within those countries, can actually collaboratively both design trade, but also diffuse kind of policy ideas across those countries. And we kind of say, I think we say this in the book, if not, we said it in some conversation that we're not wedded to like the, the label of a Green New Deal, because I think that's kind of where you get into a potential kind of imperialist, like you have to use this label and this exact framework. And there are a lot of countries with different energy systems, resource and, I mean, there's, a, you know, obviously diversity around the world in terms of where countries are at and where they are transitioning to go. So the idea would be less like, here's a model for every country country to copy and more what is a kind of multilateral framework guided by egalitarian and low carbon kind of principles in which governments could come together and not just governments, also civil society and activists to actually hash out what a multilateral trade policy would look like that governs the supply chains of the renewable transition. So we do think at kind of multiple scales. We, what we don't do is kind of try to think of like what a Paris agreement might look like, right? Like so we don't, we don't actually find that the literal international stage is the best way to start thinking about what an internationalist Green New Deal would look like. We think that, first of all, internationalist Green New Deal starts at home in the sense that like the less resources that we use, the less we're impacting the rest of the earth. So like all of our policy vision is internationalist, even in its domestic kind of um, um, instantiations. But insofar as we, 
cross-border work is really important, we don't think kind of going to these elite spaces that are highly technocratic behind closed doors and just like coming up with the perfect plan to impose on the world is the way that politics, that like an actual democratic politics should happen. And it's a, it's a hard scale for democratic politics, right? Um, so I, we think sort of building bilaterally, multilaterally and sort of regionally is a better way um, to kind of both come up with new creative ideas but also have venues in which it's more accessible for social movement organizing to actually take place and put pressure on policymakers. So those are a couple of ideas. But. So to just elaborate a little bit on something Thea just said, I mean, part of the reason we also try not to just focus on the kind of UN um, level, uh, you know, negotiations is because it just seems, so what we've seen is, is um, year after year, uh, you know, that kind of, there's, the, there's the, the elite negotiators meeting to talk about what the climate program is going to be, um, protesters coming and protesting them, um, some kind of agreement maybe is reached that nobody has really any intention to uh, deliver on. Um, but what does seem to be effective at a global level is trade policy, and that's part of why we're saying, well, actually, why don't we follow, <laughs> let's go where the money is, uh, let's follow uh, the, the places where we see actually, you know, why is... Um, and why do we see, you know, the uh, global trade agreements and, and uh, global economic infrastructure being functional is because it's functional for capital, but we need to be following that kind of um, power and money and, and trying to intervene along those lines of, of uh, you know, that connect the international um, and, and recognizing those are also part of climate change. Again, like part of the argument about how we can't just separate climate out and sort of deal with it over here while meanwhile there's the, you know, um, a whole other set of policies being made that are, you know, at, in, in many cases at complete odds. Um, and so we actually need to be focusing on uh, the global economic structures that are producing climate change. And so that is one place to, that's where we, like the impetus for why we see this as a, or one of the impetuses, impeti, I don't know, um, <laughs> for why we see this as like a, a place to, to build. But then, you know, um, what are the what does that mean in terms of organizing and are there ways that we imagine like miners in Chile uh, and Tesla workers at the factory in California actually maybe having some kind of common cause uh, there are places where there are actual real bottlenecks around these resources like there are like really um, concentrations of, of resources that are going to be very um, uh, central to things like green tech and so actually you can imagine like uh, people who are working in uh, Chilean lithium mines and indigenous communities who are organizing around that kind of, the environmental impacts of lithium mining could actually have a lot of um, power over that. And so uh, there are probably more sites of, you know, potential bottlenecks and, um, and of organizing sort of in some ways similar to the kind of organizing around like keep it in the ground against pipelines, but there are these different, you know, chains and routes through which resources move that we should be thinking about how to organize around and, and those will usually cross borders in some way. So we should be, um, that there, there are, and, th and that will look different around different kinds of, uh, you know, um, different resources or different kinds of, uh, like, thinking of different places, so we can't get sort of like a general set of principles, but there are, I think, a lot of opportunities that we haven't thought about enough, so. I'll just say one real quick uh, example of what Alyssa was just talking about. In the past, we, probably everyone in this room is aware of the massive protests in Chile against the Pineda government and neoliberal economics, but um, a couple of things that happened in the past week are that the lithium, the miners at one of the two lithium companies that operates in Chile went on, joined a general strike, and also the communities, the indigenous communities around where those lithium mines are have also um, created sort of obstacles around lithium extraction, right? And so kind of what, part of what our book is doing is sort of bringing that into view and saying like this is part of Green New Deal politics. What would a Green New Deal look like that actually opened up opportunities for being in solidarity? with indigenous communities and with workers in, in across the supply chains of, of the renewable transition. Um, and those events are happening. So the question is, you know, what kinds of both trade structures and structures of organizational solidarity can be built kind of oriented towards them? Thank you. And I'll just add something brief. Um, I mean, first of all, of course, intellectual property, like goodbye, thank you. <laughs> that was a good 100 years, you know, you had a good run. Um, and, and of course, we talk, you know, one of the reasons we need to build tens of millions of units of, of social housing over the, the decades is because we need to have house millions and millions, tens of millions of people to come into the United States. So 
it, there is an argument to be made that if there were no immigration, we could just take the penthouses uh, around Central Park and enjoy them. But we're, you know, we're going to have more people, and that's great. Um, uh, the last thing, I think we can look to the internationalism that already exists in the United States, and that is about, we, um, we haven't talked about it that much today, but the black and brown and other, and indigenous movements and many other movements in the US that are internationalists for many reasons. I mean, many people, there's the cliche that the or environmentalist is like a middle-aged white couple in their fanny packs, you know, walking through the woods, picking blueberries, looking for wind turbines to take pictures of with selfies. But if you look at the public opinion data, the like ethnic group in the US that is most concerned and motivated to act on climate change is Latinos. Um, and this has a lot to do with the um, webs of, of familiar and social relations that Latinos in the US have with other parts of the world where people are a lot more worried about climate change because they haven't been so brainwashed by imperialism. They've been bombed by it. Um, the tradition of black internationalism, I mean, we talk a lot about Du Bois, we talk about um, the, the black freedom movement, and I think you look at those movements, the civil rights movement is what led to the environmental justice movement. The Climate Justice Alliance is not unaware of the rest of the world existing. Um, and indigenous movements are not unaware of the rest of the world existing. And on the contrary, they're very active in continental politics. So I think part of what this is about is broadening the coalition, looking at the movements that we have. And sort of there's a huge number of left traditions, internationalist traditions, and we want to bring them into the Green New Deal. Um, we know that the framing sounds kind of like kind of like a container of nationalism. But I think once you break it down into constituent parts, at every level, we're finding different ways to engage, but without saying, yeah, here's like the global justice movement. We gave it to you from the Northeastern seaboard of the United States. You know? <laughs> I, just, yeah. I don't think that's the right thing to do. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, sort of in spite of itself, the Green New Deal has caught on um, in, in other places. Um, I mean, particularly in sort of um, places like the United States who have a historical responsibility on climate change, who have built sort of mass fortunes around um, exploiting resources and labor from other parts of, of the world. I mean, and so you have um, Spain, uh, which uh, the Socialist Workers Party, the center left Socialist Workers Party there, um, just won its its election is now in coalition with Podemos, the sort of left populist party. Um, and both of them in um, the last round of elections campaigned on the Green New Deal. I think um, Pessoa uh, called it the Green New Deal. Um, and Podemos, if I'm getting this right, called it a uh, Green uh, New Deal Verde, um, I believe. So it's, it's taking on different, um, you know, different iterations abroad. Um, there are people in the European Parliament who are now sort of drafting up um, a, a Green New Deal for the European Union. Um, there is a lot of interest in this, despite, I mean, sort of bafflingly, because the New Deal is such an American reference point, um, are, you know, picking it up and running with it, which is, you know, to hear, um, I, I was on a panel with, with a French MEP um, recently, and she was like, it's very sad that this is, this is what we're talking about, um, that the New Deal is sort of the um, example of of, of big, you know, big state-led economic development um, that we have to draw on uh, in other parts of the world. And I think, um, just to echo what, what folks have just said, um, I do think there's sort of a unique responsibility of countries like the United States, of, you know, the UK, um, just to mention, which is now in the midst of a general election campaign, um, passed a, a very, very, uh, a green leader that looks, you know, close to a lot of what we lay out in this book um, through the, the Labor Party process. We'll see what shows up in the manifesto um, in a couple days, but but the, the party is very interested and is running on a Green New Deal. Um, they sometimes call it a green industrial policy as well. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, those those countries and others who have built these, you know, these sort of fortunes um, that have been unequally distributed within their own borders um, have a responsibility not just to bring down, um, bring down emissions uh, radically um, and, and very quickly to, you know, ease up the rest of the carbon budget for the rest of the world um, for folks to be allowed to consume uh, more than they more than they have um, but uh, also to, to sort of think about what democratizing the world system looks like I mean just from sort of you know a, a pure like very pragmatic uh, point of view, the U.S. wields enormous power in at virtually every international institution. And so what does it look like to really leverage that um, toward 
uh, the ends of, of global justice toward you know, supporting things like self-determination, things like you know, true global democracy in a way that the US has consistently in, in you know, every year of its history worked to undermine. Um, so we actually just don't know what that could look like. We don't know what a, a, a US that is working toward a Green New Deal um, within our own borders and working toward one globally, um, all of what it can do because we've just never seen that happen. It's always, you know, we've always been a sort of imperialist nation. And so um, I, you know, am excited for, for what that project could look like. And I think it's one of the, the most promising aspects of the Green New Deal is kind of what it could do to, um, to our international institutions. All right, I think uh, one more, and then we'll go to, to Q&A. Uh, and jumping off of something you just said, Kate, about uh, basically the New Deal being the model. And I think, obviously, there are, are parts of that legacy that are not great. But also, there are a lot of very direct uh, models and comparisons you can make to different programs that came out uh, in that project. And you outline a lot of them in the book. So I don't know if you could... Talk about the New Deal itself and, and some of the things that you thought were, were most uh, worthy of, of re-examining and, and maybe replicating in a new Green Deal, a Green New Deal, a new Green New Deal. Sure. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to try a slightly unusual attack maybe on this question. Um, I think we, we have, you know, we're at the Verso Loft, so we have to say something about capitalism. Yes. <laughs> um, and, you know, you will have noticed that we talk about radically reducing the power of the boss or replacing it in the workplace and public ownership of large parts of the economy. So we are talking about taking on capital um, in the next few years. And you might wonder, how the hell are you going to do that? Um, and we do have a plan. We have a plan for that. It's on Medium. Just kidding. It's in the book. Um, uh, and what we talk about is that there will be, for sure, another massive recession. There will be huge climate disasters. We know because they're happening already. And I think the fact that the private utility model is under so much scrutiny and pressure in California is because there have been these horrifying fires and people don't want to take it and it's murderous. Um, so we know there's going to be a recession. We know that there's going to be an election. We know that there are going to be climate crises coinciding. Um, we talk in the book about how Obama utterly wasted the opportunity that he had. And one of the really interesting, there's a, an interesting book about this called Crisis Wasted, but it compares the Obama transition to, to the New Deal, actually. So when FDR got elected, actually then the transition was much slower. He didn't take power until March. And uh, Hoover was begging FDR to sign off on Hoover's policies. And FDR refused. And he let everything get worse and worse and worse. And by the time FDR came in, basically had the economy over a barrel. Um, in contrast, what happened under Obama was that the minute Bush put out TARP, Obama was like, continuity. Continuity. So there was, and they basically made all the important decisions to restore the system. So Obama says to a crowd of businessmen, my job is to stand between you and the pitchforks. And what we say, and I think I credit Alyssa for this one, is that we should have instead, he should have built a solar paneled pitchfork factory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think a really important lesson of the New Deal is that when the next crisis comes, we are ready for it. We have to mobilize like crazy for it. We know that this time, unlike 08, there will be millions of people in the streets, I think, during the next recession. They will be pushing for it. And the fight right now, I think, is to push every possible concrete, specific idea, like a Green New Deal for housing, like worker cooperatives for clean energy, you name it, and have those ideas ready so that when the green stimulus comes, it is massive and it is led from below. Um, and we could talk about all the different New Deal programs, which are cool, but at the origin of it is getting ready for that crisis and seizing the moment in a really aggressive way and just iteratively fighting, 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 fighting. The peak of industrial worker power in the New Deal is not in 32 or 33, but it comes later. So it's the ratcheting, ratcheting, ratcheting of victories. And every one of our chapters is about the way that these concrete and immediate gains build the strength, the confidence, the material uh, momentum to then fight for more. So this is really a short-term vision for radically transforming economic and power relations in the 2020s, go as far as we possibly can, destroying carbon, destroying inequality. Um, to add to that, uh, which is that it is a short-term vision, but it's also a long-term one. Obviously, uh, I mean, climate change is sort of the fight of the rest of our lives, I think. And, um, and so one of the ways that I think that we think about the New Deal is that, um, the Green New Deal is sometimes treated, I think, as like it's going to be a policy or a climate policy is going to be a piece of legislation or something like that. And, and one of the things that I do think we should, we should um, think 
take from the New Deal is, is the thinking about it as an era or a framework for policies or a sort of a, a major shift in sort of the configuration of political economy and, and everything that sort of flows from that. And so thinking about how this is not, uh, you know, we're trying to outline a, a vision of things that we think are possible to begin um, building in the short term. And uh, but that's also part of a, a, a real like reconfiguration of what um, our economy and society looks like. And I think that that is something that um, we shouldn't get you know, distracted by sort of, um, uh, well, I guess I would say either, you know, think like this one bill is, is you know, all or nothing or, or it's um, a set of policies. It is um, an ongoing project that I think we should be, we need to be thinking about all of our other policies and, and projects through. And so we, you know, we can't cover everything in this book, um, but as we argue, we think all politics are climate politics in the 21st century. And so we really do need to be thinking about how all of our other um, really all of our political issues, all of our political projects are connected to and part of um, thinking about climate politics and about something like the Green New Deal. And so I think that's sort of the, um, the charge, but also the invitation to, you know, like we have not figured everything out. We want everyone to be thinking about how can we advance this because we, we know we need to have, um, uh, to have really a, a kind of comprehen comprehensive vision um, of what that is. Um, I just, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll just say just really briefly because it's basically been covered but just from a, on a personal note and everyone here can attest to this um, not everyone here but everyone here um, some people there um, I was not enthralled with the Green New Deal I, like, like as a concept or as a label or as a frame um, maybe some other of us weren't either whatever we had a lot of internal debates when we first started working on this and my concern was that the Green New Deal, first of all, you have all of, I mean, there's wonderful positive legacies of the New Deal, many of which we still enjoy today, but there's also a lot of negative legacies of the New Deal in terms of segregation, Jim Crow, the exclusion of domestic and farm workers, and just a whole host of, like, is this just too tainted of a concept to work forward with? And then my other thought was sort of like, do millennials or Zoomers or whoever, do they care <laughs> about the New Deal? Like, does it mean anything to them? Um, their lives have been so thoroughly shaped by neoliberal deprivation. Does, like, the idea of of like an activist government, like will that resonate and will the specific sort of 1930s variant of that resonate? And I love to admit when I'm wrong, it happens sometimes. <laughs> um, so I was wrong, I mean in the sense that first of all, the Green New Deal has created its own, like it's its own set of ideas, it's its own terrain, it's its own set of associations that doesn't per se rely on a sort of nostalgia politics of like remaking America into something it never was for, for most people, right? So that's one thing. And the other is we have a lot of like data for progress people in the room so that I see around occluding here. And like it, it yeah, you're 40% of this table. And, um, it also polls well, I mean, and, and also like, <laughs> That data, data for Progress and also Gen Forward, I think, is another great outf outfit that's done a lot of polling specifically among youth. And, like, it turns out that, like, youth of color are, like, among the most excited to have an activist government that does something good in their lives instead of just criminalizing them and depriving them of basic needs. So, like, it turns out that this is a popular frame and it isn't a nostalgic frame and it is, like, an invitation and an opening into, like, a new way of thinking about the relationship between state and society. Um, and so... We've kind of run with, stuck with it, run with it, and I've been more than convinced about, um, about it. Um. Um, I'll just add on briefly about um, the original New Deal, which I think is a good lesson for, for this one. And, and, you know, just to say that the New Deal, of course, was not a monolith. It was this, like, very big, like, largely improvised program that, that rolled out over the course of 10 years and, you know, continued on well after that, well after the war even, in some ways. Um, but I think one thing, it, I mean, the, the basic point which I think has been made is that it re, like asserted a positive role for the federal government um, to say that, you know, the federal government wasn't just there um, to, you know, take away, take away your things, uh, which is how, you know, the sort of like anti-communist campaigns at the time um, tried, to, tried to paint it, um, but that the federal government could, you know, furnish not just um, needs, but wants as well. Um, and I, some of the, the parts of the New Deal that I find kind of the most inspiring and, and offer the biggest lessons are things like the Federal Theater Project, which is under the Works Progress Administration. Um, and, you know, I think encapsulates two of those things, which is that, um, you know, you have Harry Hopkins sort of on a train with a person whose name I'm forgetting who he taps to run the Federal um, Theater Project. And his question, his main question, what? Howie Flanagan. Wow, thank you. Yeah, Howie, Howie Flanagan. Um, 
who he taps to run it, and his, his first question to her is, how much money can you spend? Uh, <laughs> on theater, on, 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 on putting on plays, um, which is kind of remarkable. Plays that you know, democratize the arts um, in a big way, and, and importantly, um, made the case for the New Deal as it went. Um, so you have something like, uh, there's a play called Power, uh, which I, I'm forgetting exactly when it came on, but the whole plot of this play um, is a sort of like downtrodden farmer. Um, like I, there's a scene where he's just sort of like talking to um, his wife and saying, you know, I just wish we had power. And she says, you can take the power. And then like, <laughs> and then all, like, all the townspeople get together and form a rural electric cooperative. Um, <laughs> So I don't write plays, but um, it would be nice to see something along those lines um, as part of the, the, the Green New Deal as well. Um, I would love to, you know, if there are people who can make good political art, um, please, you know, get involved. Because um, a lot of it's really bad. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, I think, I think the, the, it's this whole new framework for thinking about, you know, what is the relationship between the state and the economy? What do we, what do we owe to one another? Um, and I think that, that is, you know, the, the best thing it did was this real sort of frame shift in, in what are we prioritizing as a society is, is I think, the biggest, the biggest lesson we can, we can take. Let's take a couple questions. Um, I'm going to take three questions at a time and then turn it back to the panelists. We probably just have time for like six questions total. So can you raise your hand? Sorry, can I get... Hi, thanks, and thanks for all that you've shared and envisioned. Um, when you spoke about the five principles, you mentioned the right to mobility, and one of the pieces was migration, and I wonder if you can say more about how the book addresses climate-induced um, um, displacement, and as well as the politics of addressing migration in this context. Hi, um, so, First, I'm really excited about this, um, this vision, but I also really appreciated what you had to say about making sure we're not replicating oppressive social systems and particularly making sure we're not rejecting some of the advances of black radicalism. And so keeping that in mind, I'm curious to hear more about what Alyssa said about um, using the repressive state apparatus to you know, punish fossil executives, keeping in mind what people like Miriam Kaba, the prison abolitionist, have said about you know, how prosecutorial campaigns shouldn't support, you know, criminalizing bosses or landlords, particularly because we're not interested in trying to retake the repressive state apparatus for the left. So I'd love to hear more about how you reconcile that and what your vision is for that. I'm not trying to push this as like a fuck you, but just as like, <laughs> but just as like, I'd love to hear more, thanks. Hi, um, I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Uh, question has to do with the elections coming up. H how do you see the vision that you're putting forward in the book meshing up with the different um, climate policies of Warren or Bernie in particular? And then what do you see as the stakes of the Democratic primary in 2020 for winning the Green New Deal that we're envisioning? OK, turn it over to you guys. Yeah, I'll just talk about it briefly. Um, so I'm going to just pick up briefly on the question about um, the sort of abolitionist question about um, should we be worried about using prosecutorial or repressive means to go after fossil fuel companies. And I, and I do hear that. Um, I actually don't think it really applies. I don't think the critique neatly applies to this case, though it's a critique in general that I'm very, very, that I wholeheartedly endorse. Like, I think in general, um, there are a lot of well-intentioned expansions of the carceral state out there. Um, in, this, in terms of, you know, if we look at, you know, domestic abuse, if we look at tons of areas through which, um, um, tons of policy areas through which the carceral state has been expand expanded, whatever the intentions of those were, which may have been good, the outcome is that there's criminalization of medical 
color specifically, but also other, other populations, right? And so we definitely, you know, the concern is partly about what types of repression and who could they potentially be redeployed against. And I'm not sure I see, I mean, I'm like happy to have a dialogue, maybe we can do so afterwards, but I'm not sure how I see trying fossil fuel executives at The Hague sort of redounding back towards an expansion of the domestic carceral state. I think that the, it, it's at different scales, the tools are distinct. Um, it doesn't involve bloating the criminal justice system in the US so much as using existing international laws towards a target that they're not generally used for, but in the sort of, under the kind of rubric of a left populist kind of vision of we need to name our enemies and we need to hold people responsible and we need to hold capital responsible and capital is not just an abstract social relation, it's also people that own things and have done bad things with them. So, you know, I, I hear the abolitionist critique, but I don't, I think if we're not looking at domestic expansions of carcerality, then it doesn't, it doesn't quite apply in this case. And there's a great piece in The Intercept by Natasha Leonard on exactly this point that you should read if you're interested in it more. Um, thank you for these questions. Very, I mean, we, we don't give immigration the attention that it should have. I mean, we, there were four of us, we wrote this book quickly, and the two, I think the two biggest topics we would have added chapters for if we had put in more time and expertise would be immigration and, and agriculture. I mean, the food question is a massive question. It involves questions of class, it involves questions of race, land ownership in the South. I mean, one could go on. So um, I think we believe in a world of scarcity of billionaires and <laughs> beautiful public luxury for all who, can, who, who want to come. Um, but we don't give that project, you know, we don't give a ton of attention to that issue, and we should. It's simply one of the two issues that we didn't get to it in depth because of space. Um, quickly on the election, that's a great question. I mean, look, um, Bernie is put out by like an order of magnitude, the biggest plan. The Bernie campaign fundamentally understands that nobody is going to like fax the campaign platform onto like the bodies of every American that, on January 1st. Like this is an outline, it's a scheme. It's not like Warren's plans are not just going to become reality like by divine you know, induction. Like the thing is to win, to build a movement, to build ideas and, to, and then things get debated. So Bernie's plan I think is, is great. A lot of experts uh, actually love it. Sorry, New York Times. Um, but, <laughs> I, you know, we could talk for hours about how smart it is and how important it is to go big in public, whatever. We all know that. I think the thing we actually have to focus on is something a little bit different. We talk in the book about going um, all out and understanding that there will be setbacks and that, you know, not, you know, not me, us means that we don't hang the future of humanity on who wins the presidential primary. We hang the future of humanity on a mobilized mass movement that knows what it, what it wants to do. And if the political theory of the Bernie um, supporters, and I include myself in that, if our political theory is correct, then under a President Warren with a mass movement during a recession and a need for a stimulus, we can get what we need to keep fighting forward. So I think I am all in for campaigning for Bernie and there's no question about that, but I don't think we have the luxury of tying this project to any one particular fight or person. Like Alyssa said, this is a framework for struggle for 10, 20, 30 years to give us a chance to fight again for 10, 20, or 30 years. Um, and yes, anybody who understands that the biggest plan needs the biggest movement, they are the one. They, you know, they get it. At the same time, like we are the ones. Um, yes. So, um, two, one, one brief thing on migration, which is that um, although we don't uh, devote, I think, as much time as it deserves, uh, I, I will say that. The worst thing for immigration politics and migration politics seems to me is um, austerity and uh, a, a situation wherein um, you create the conditions for the scapegoating of immigrants and migrants as sort of the, the reason that you don't have a job, the reason that you can't pay your bills, the reason that you can't afford to live somewhere and so on. And so I think that we need to, it is really important actually to counter um, uh, various forms of, of either, you know, sort of enforced austerity or um, uh, the sense of deprivation and that are we, I think what we're trying to envision in terms of having um, various forms of public abundance is, is uh, I think, one, a really important component of how we can um, head off uh, the politics of, uh, you know, anti-immigrant politics from the right. Um, and then to add to what Thea said on the sort of state question or repressive state question, we should definitely also use the state against, you know, to, uh, part of the, the answer was also about um, 
about using it against corporations and using it to, to you know, discipline capital, um, which I think is something that is not certainly um, even less, obviously, uh, analogous to sort of carceral policies. So, um, so we, you know, I think there are a lot of different ways that, that we're thinking about how to use the state in that way, but that is certainly one of them. Just, I'm very brief. I mean, Ilhan Rashida, AOC, campaigning with Bernie on like a militant, explicitly anti-imperialist Green New Deal politics is fucking great. So it's, <laughs> that is really, 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 really great. <laughs> and we love it. <laughs> we're, we're fighting for it. <laughs> Sam, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, on, on migration, I mean, I think there is a patently pretty ugly history within environmentalism of, uh, that, that is sort of commingled with the most um, xenophobic, most racist. Um, elements of, of the anti-immigration movement where you have, you know, people who are actively involved in the Sierra Club, like John Tanton, um, starting things like Numbers USA. I think I'm getting that right, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. I see someone nodding who knows the answer. Um, but, uh, but, so I think we have recast that, and, and part of, you know, the, the sort of scarcity framing of environmentalism is also the scarcity framing of, of, you know, just public goods and resources. And so I think we're trying to really... Um, hit that head on, and I think that's what a really ambitious Green New Deal does, is sort of reframe that um, away from away from this politics of scarcity and naming an enemy very clearly so that people aren't left to sort of invent one on their own, or, you know, right-wing zealots are, are left to invent those um, for themselves. And so by, by being clear about, about who the enemies are, um, I think we, we really, you know, help build the movement that we need by saying we are all on the same page. Most, you know, most of us um, are on the same page about this and there's a very very small segment of society which is which is not and that's that's kind of where we have to where we have to train our energies um, and yeah I mean I would agree with with what um, everyone said on kind of like repressive state structures using that I think it's a particular there are particular mechanisms within like the International Criminal Court within um, you know sort of those sorts of tribunals and things that um, are apart from from as I, I would agree that they're they're sort of apart from from bloating the the carceral state um, as we know it. and I think any Green New Deal should look to um, dismantle the carceral state as um, some folks in the audience have written about in the series we um, have it at um, uh, Jacobin um, which you should read Green New Deal for decarceration yeah um, sort of tying those two things together so find find them in the audience um, if if you would like to talk more um, about how how central decarceration is um, to to this vision. Um, yeah, on on um, on the 2020 primary, I mean, I think I would just agree with everything Daniel said there. Um, we have a candidate who is, you know, by far and above um, presenting the most ambitious vision, the most realistic plan for how to get it, um, and uh, but also with with a very clear understanding that whoever is in office, whether that's Bernie, whether that's Warren. Hopefully it's one of those two, um, but we'll, you know, that will be a fight, right? We don't just give up if we get a good president in office. That was the, you know, defining mistake of the of the Obama era, um, and why we did not get climate policy in, in, in 2000, 2009, 2010 um, was because we gave up the fight and sort of left, um, you know, left um, the the White House and Congress to its own devices, essentially. All right, can we take a few more questions? Hi, thank you. This is a really good discussion. I'm excited to read the book. Um, I had a question if you could respond to some of the critiques around the framing of a Green New Deal from environmental justice groups or climate, like the Climate Justice Alliance um, in terms of both like the framing as well as like the process of how the current iteration of what we're calling the Green New Deal was created. Uh, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe expand on a, the idea of food sovereignty under the Green New Deal or like global systems that have been um, disentangled from fossil capital. Yeah, this is a fantastic panel and I hope the uh, video will get uh, widely disseminated and publicized <laughs> afterwards. Um, <laughs> Two things. Uh, one, I think the political value of trials for the Tillerson and company would be not so much the cathartic value of seeing them behind bars or at the dock, but, but the educational uh, impact that that could have globally. 
of uh, cutting through all of the uh, climate denialism once and for all and exposing their role in that. So, uh, but uh, the main thing I wanted to bring up was uh, just to follow up on the international uh, front. Uh, there are uh, a number of high carbon nationalist regimes in power globally right now. Uh, Modi, Bolsonaro, MBS in Saudi Arabia and so on. And I'm just I'm wondering if we can do a thought experiment about the, the uh, effect that a, uh, a US government uh, in rapidly implementing a Green New Deal uh, could have on uh, those countries and those rulers and their situations and begin to catalyze uh, a global uh, reaction against their uh, projects and plans. Um, I'll speak briefly to the question about concerns from the environmental justice community around the Green New Deal. Um, and um, I've read a lot of the statements of different coalitions, so the, the um, Climate Justice Alliance, the um, Indigenous Environmental Network, um, the Red Deal, which now has is there's a fuller version of. And then um, as part of DSA, we have an eco-socialist Green New Deal um, proposal. So. In all of those, I don't so much see like a rejection of the Green New Deal. Um, there's kind of two different categories I'd put them in. One is radicalization and the other is like specific qualms. So there are, there's the Red Deal and the DSA Eco-Socialist Green New Deal, which have kind of taken the Green New Deal as a kind of invitation, as Alyssa, the word Alyssa used earlier, to kind of broaden the possibility of what a Green New Deal could look like. And I think that's probably exactly the, the perspective that we take in, in this book. Um, and so looking at a Green New Deal that is thoroughly anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist, that you know attacks racism and patriarchy um, and settler colonialism. And, and so that, and, and the Red Deal explicitly is framed as like, we would love a Green New Deal and let's do 500 other things, right? And so it is that sort of invitation and sort of an opening gambit into a, a broader struggle. Um, and then just to speak specifically to kind of, I think, some of the groups you might be referencing, what I've seen is less among, like, the Climate Justice Alliance and the Indigenous Environmental Network, a rejection of the Green New Deal and more concerns about specific pieces of it, like the idea of zero carbon. Would that mean offsets? Would that mean um, biofuels? Like, what would that look like? So they also have embraced a lot of the Green New Deal, but take an issue, I think, rightfully, with some of the potentially techno-optimist kind of components of how the conversation generally um, has occurred. Um, I'll say something on the food sovereignty piece, which is that, um, as Daniel mentioned, I think uh, agri... Well, I don't know. Did you mention this? Anyway, uh, ag yeah. <laughs> like, what? Did you just mention this, or is this a different conversation we had? Um, anyway, so agriculture is something that we don't talk about nearly enough in the book, although we try to talk at least a little bit about... Um, uh, you know, the ways that agriculture needs to change and improve um, from, uh, in order to be both more ecologically sustainable and more, um, you know, socially uh, sustainable. Because labor, uh, obviously, farm work is among the most exploited in the country. Um, it's, again, within the U.S. context of sort of thinking about what uh, that would look like and, and um, I think drawing on many principles similar to that of many food sovereignty movements. But, you know, I think we certainly support that and that could be, I think, is also connected to things like trade policy. What are, you know, U.S. trade policies and um, agricultural subsidies doing to uh, other kinds of, uh, you know, to farmers around the world? Um, and so I think there's, you know, a lot that's really important there that we don't talk about in a ton of detail, but that is, is really great. And I'll just use this to give a shout out to another piece in the series we edited, which is Raj Patel and Jim Goodman wrote an amazing piece um, about uh, a, new deal, a Green New Deal for Agriculture drawing on both the history of, of farmers' movements during the original New Deal and like farmer labor movements and also doing an analysis of the current global food systems and, and how um, uh, a Green New Deal within the U.S. could both improve our own food system, but also uh, change the relationship of U.S. Uh, food production to other parts of the world. And I think it's, it's a really great piece, so I uh, recommend that you go out and read it. <laughs> um, okay, thank you for these questions. Um, I do a lot of work in Brazil, in Sao Paulo especially, um, and on housing. Um, uh, it's terrifying what's happening there. Um, I, I'm glad you brought it up. What's happening in the Amazon is terrifying. There is a lot that's going on in Latin America that is very frightening. Um, I think it's important to note that Bolsonaro, like Trump, is extremely dangerous, but also lacks true hegemony. Um, but then we have to remember that Mussolini and Hitler never got more than 40% of the vote. Um, so I, somewhat personal answer, I'm, I saw Mary Hegler here, I don't know if she's still here, but she's, um, 
She has often spoken about the need to be emotionally honest about climate change. So, okay, well, here is my attempt. Um, <laughs> so, I, you know, I grew up in Toronto with a Guatemalan mother and a Jewish father, and both genocides became parts of my teenage years. You know, the first few years were fine, it was chill. Then they started telling me the stories. Um, and I think when you grow up in that context and then you read the world's best science telling you, hey, an apocalypse is around the corner, it's like, pay attention, you know. The, Jewish, the lesson of the Jewish prophetic tradition isn't like, uh, everything's gonna be fine. <laughs> 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 and um, <laughs> it's not the lesson of Guatemalan history either. Um, so yeah, I have had many horrible and long nights um, and I won't give you my whole journey here, but I'll say that you know I have a very weird paradoxical situation, which is that I'm essentially a night person who's sad at night and very grumpy in the morning, but bizarrely uh, more practically optimistic. So we say in the book, like our vision is not some kind of Pollyannish, everything is just gonna be fine. It's like, hi, this is the situation, sorry. It's not our fault, some other fucking assholes. Yes, if we're gonna have jails, use it for them. And I think The Hague is nice because it will be um, a test of the resilient waterproof uh, housing um, <laughs> for Rex Tillerson. Um, and I'm excited to see what Exxon's technology that he vaunts has done for those forms of resiliency. So this is what gets me out of the bed in the morning is really concretely thinking like not just the graph of emissions coming down in the IPCC chart, but like what could we actually do in the next five years? We know that we can do this. And this, so it's like there, we talk about rebuilding our built environment, decarbonizing, making us safer, abolishing inequalities, that there will be more than electric wires linking beautiful public housing, speedy trains, verdant landscapes of public and renewable power. The projects will be linked by the irresistible dream of ordinary people seizing control of their place in the world. Stopping the climate emergency will be our chance to build glorious communal luxuries, planted tree by tree, strung light by light, sculpted stone by stone. I think there's a lot to get us out of bed in the morning and be in this fight. <laughs> That, that just seems like a great place to end, and I feel like I'm going to screw it up if I talk more, so let's take that with us into the, the rest of the night. Does anyone have, do you guys have any final comments? Thanks, everyone, for coming and come have a drink with us and uh, ask us any other questions you might have. We're around and happy to talk. So Please so much. Um, visit the DSA Eco Socialist table in the back. Oh, and Science for the People wants to make a very quick announcement and buy a copy of Descent magazine is in the back there. Buy a copy of A Planet to Win. If you buy a, a copy of the book, book, you get a free drink. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we're going to have a quick announcement by Science for the People. Hi, just wanted to say if anyone is inspired um, by these folks to write or any kind of art, uh, Science for the People, which is a radical magazine that was started in the 70s by scientists and activists. We're currently in revitalized publication and we're looking for any kind of submissions um, by January 10th, I think, for our People's Green New Deal issue. So keep that in mind. And um, Science for the People um, website will have information under submissions. Thank you. Yeah.